Hi, Debbie. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Debbie Dashinger, pleasure to have you. And first, I want to thank my sponsor, Dr. Dane Here, who's the co-founder of Access Consciousness. If you want to find out more about the facilitator workshops that they offer all around the world, the many products, and uh, they do some really cutting edge work. So if you're looking for something like that to either join and participate in or to become a facilitator in as a career, go to drdanehere.com. It's D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com and accessconsciousness.com. Also, I wanna thank whomever you are out there by the name of The Name Lady. You have left us a really nice review. And as I always tell you, we read all of them. So thank you so much for the five-star reviews. And The Name Lady at Apple Podcasts wrote, always amazing. Debbie's shows are always informational and fun. Debbie does an incredible job of choosing her guests and bringing out their best. I promise you today will be no different with my guest today. And if you're interested, I would please urge you to subscribe to Dare to Dream. You can do it through Apple and Google Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, BSSR Radio, Radio Public, or Player FM, and iHeart Radio. So just take a moment. I know you guys listen, and I really do appreciate everything you write, even on YouTube. It's been terrific. When you leave a five-star review, it makes a difference because the right people find us. So my question to you today is, have you ever felt that reality contains a spiritual dimension hidden from your five senses? Well, my guest today is transformational leader and author Lee Harris, who says that spiritual dimension became startlingly real one day when he began communicating with the Z's, a group of non-physical beings from another plane of reality. Lee Harris has written a new book, and that book is called Energy Speaks. He's also an intuitive medium, musician, and visual artist. And in 2004, Lee began holding channeling sessions in readings in his home, and today he leads workshops throughout the world. He's a native of England, but we are so lucky to have him now based in California. You can visit Lee Harris online at leeharrisenergy.com. Lee, welcome to Dare to Dream. It's so amazing to have you. Debbie, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Pleasure. And as I alluded to you in the beginning, and just to give a profound thank you, you know, there are, uh, I know, I used to have clients who were channels. I do a lot of media consulting out in the world. And they used to call people who facilitate connections runners. Hmm. And so using their term, we have a runner. And my friend Amy is the one who several times said, wow, there's this guy and I follow him. And, and every video he puts out is so profound. And sometimes it went over the top and she always had to send out the link to myself and another friend and say, watch this, watch this. And I would, because the conversation you provide is the conversation I enjoy. So it was Lee Harris. So imagine my surprise, not, when your publicity manager came to me and said, oh, by the way, I've got a client. Would you be interested in interviewing them? And now here you are connecting with me. Well, yeah, thank you. And thank you to Kim, who is the New World Library, um, the publisher I'm with, their publicity manager for connecting us. And, and thanks. You know, it's funny you, you said about the conversation. I, I feel like, so I create these energy updates every month, the videos you're referring to, and they're free on YouTube. And I feel like um, my job is to be a conversation starter in those videos for, for, for us, all of us to kind of um, if, if you resonate with those videos, then you can have conversations with your friends, conversations with yourself. I often feel that my job is really to translate energy into the best language I can um, so that all of us can make it more real because energy is so real in our lives and yet none of us really grew up being taught that or being asked to focus on that. And I think that's what's so fascinating about the time we're in now where that's becoming part of the conversation globally in so many different ways. So, yeah. 
It's really interesting. I appreciate what you just shared. And even the title of your book, Energy Speaks, because it's the one thing I've gotten right in my life, right? And, and that's not to put down my life or my choices, because I feel like I've had a lot of great things happen. What I mean is the one thing that has consistently been perfect is when I follow energy. It seems to be the one thing I can do right because logically I've never been able to make a choice or decision with great ease. But when energy presents to me and there's a sense of something like just this big yes, no matter what goes on here, I have learned enough to just blindly, if you will, follow it. And it's amazing to me what unfolds. How does that work for you? Very similar. You know, I, I think I, the, the one way that I followed energy when I was younger was creativity. So I was a highly creative child. Um, I now know I was also very intuitive, but I didn't really understand that in terms of people. That didn't happen until my late teens. And probably not unlike you or anybody listening at first, it was, um, it was having to will myself to follow or trust my instinct. I had to learn what's the difference between a mental thought and a feeling. And usually the difference is the mental thoughts have all the answers or they think they do. And they can tell you why you should or shouldn't do something six or seven ways. But the intuition is usually a little mysterious. And you don't really know what you're walking into a lot of the time. And sure, your thoughts can help you strategize or can sometimes stop you putting all your life savings into an instinct, which, you know, I think many of us have jumped out of the plane without a parachute to learn that. Um, but, but intuition is always leading us forth into creating something very new in our life um, or, or going a way that we wouldn't normally go. And it's interesting because I've done this work professionally now for 15 years. And one of the things that surprises me is how much we as people don't understand how intuitive we are. Mm. So especially if I've ever been introduced at a party as a channeler or an intuitive, you always know who you're talking to based on how they react. So, you know, there's some people and, you know, they'll go, oh, that's interesting. Or what does that mean? Tell me more. And then there's some people who are like, you know, they fold their arms. And, and, and so what, 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 what it took me years to figure out is we're all intuitive because we all read energy all of the time. So, for example, I could come on your show and say to you, hi, Debbie, I'm so happy to be here. And my energy is what tells us what those words mean. So, you know, I could go, hi, Debbie, I'm so happy to be here. Or I could go, hi, Debbie, I'm so happy to be here. And immediately, all of us get a feeling of what my energy is. So I always question anybody who says they aren't intuitive. I, I think we're all reading and sensing all of the time. But you have to, number one, believe that that energy is transmitting information that you're picking up on. And number two, learn to trust it and trust your gut feeling more than what your sister tells you you should or shouldn't do based on either her experience or logic. And, and that's the bit that I think we all tend to find difficult um, because that's not how most of us were raised, certainly not in our generation, Jenny, uh, Debbie. I think more people, younger people have that maybe, but our, our generation, it's, uh, it's, it's not what we grew up in, most of us. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not supported at large in society either. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to function because it has a lot of flow to it. And yet it's actually against the flow of what we're shown or taught is correct out there. Yeah. Yeah. And you alluded to your beginnings and, and how you were intuitive, but not in touch with your intuition. And I know that in the year 2000, when you were 23 years old, this is when your whole life really started to change. And I love this, that you heard the voice of your spirit guides for the first time on your way to work on the London Underground train. I mean, what a public place to have that happen. So can you talk a little bit about that transformational time and what occurred for you? So I was 
on a path of healing. I had gone through my teenage years dealing with my sensitivity and my intuition mm -hmm. and also knowing that I wasn't heterosexual and kind of trying to figure that out and recognizing that was going to be a problem in society, or at least that's what society was telling me. Um, I dealt with that through becoming addicted to sugar and I was taken to Weight Watchers age 10. Um, I was in and out of diet clinics all my teens, yo-yo, yo-yoing with weight. And then I uh, kind of crowned it with bulimia in my late teens. So I had a lot of personal healing to do. I had to kind of pick myself out of the rubble of all of that. And it, you know, it took years and years and years. And um, I went to lots of healing workshops and was very interested in metaphysics. But no part of me either thought I would be a channeler or wanted to be a channeler because, to be honest, it's kind of inconvenient, especially back then. You know, it's not like, you know, you go into a... I, I was really passionate about music and that was where I thought I was going. So if you say to most people, oh, I'm a singer-songwriter, most people go, oh, cool, because everybody likes music. And if you say to people, I'm a channeler, it's like, oh, you know, it's the whole... And I was like, oh, God, I, I already had to come out as gay. I don't want to have to do this as well. So it was, it was a bit of a shock when it happened, but also part of the reason that me having that happen to me on the London Underground was so weird was I really had it in my head that I should have been on a vegan diet three months into meditating in some monastery somewhere for that to happen. I didn't understand that actually the power for me of it happening on the underground is that I now tell people all the time, oh, channeling does not, it's, it, it is, it's a sacred thing in a certain way, but you also have to kind of come down to earth and go, all of life is sacred. We can have a heart opening on the tube or the train and we can have a heart opening in a monastery and they're just they're just different places different spaces so when i first heard them after kind of realizing it wasn't schizophrenia because i had to stay open to that for the first 24 hours or so i just heard this direct voice and i was sifting through all the negative um beating myself up thoughts that i had that morning which was typical for me mm -hmm. at that time and all of a sudden there was this voice from the left that said, that's a very interesting idea, but you're wrong. And I was like, huh? Because this, this had never happened before. And the thing I was really thinking about in that moment was an argument that I was having with my then partner. And they proceeded to explain why I was wrong, why it was my fault, and what was triggering me. With no, I didn't feel chastised, I didn't feel shouted at, mm -hmm. I didn't feel judged. But as soon as they explained what was going on, everything in my awareness and my body just opened. Mm -hmm. And um, so I asked like, is this schizophrenia? Are you, and they, they said, we're your guides. And we've been talking to you since childhood, but you've never been able to hear us. And that triggered some memories of like dreams, a recurring dream I used to have um, when I was a kid. And I, I talk about that in the book. And what happened for me then was I spent the next three, four months asking them questions every night. When I would come home from my, my day job, which at the time was in fundraising, I would ask them millions of questions about my life, about people in my life, about the universe at large. And to this day, um, I still channel and I still channel publicly and on some recordings. Um, but what actually happened for me through really trusting and working with and listening to my guides is it made me trust my own intuition even more and it, it 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 gave me this new relationship where the world was no longer black and white it was suddenly many colors and i had to include spirit the one thing i will say is that was very easy for me personally because it always felt like home and talking to them does still feel like home what made me most nervous about it was trying to explain it to other people and having to deal with other people's reactions toward it. So uh, that, was, that was the trickiest thing about it. But the minute I met them, it was like, oh, we're family. I get this. I don't know how, but it, just, it was just undeniably um, useful, helpful, loving, and a game changer. Beautiful. You know, I was so grateful in the beginning, in the introduction of your book, when you talk about your childhood, because frankly, there was so much I could relate to. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the emotional pain that you felt. 
and trying to find comfort from a world where you felt like a stranger, like, whoa, very powerful. And you went on to say that, this is a quote from you, that we as human beings are never truly alone and never really outsiders, that each one of us is, has an irreplaceable part of something greater than we can imagine. So true. And we're, we're all, I think of us all as jigsaw pe puzzle, jigsaw puzzle pieces. So we're part of this tapestry and we all have a part to play. And for example, one of the things that I learned, and I love hearing that you related to the introduction, because I, I, I really feel that, you know, there's one voice among us, there's one story among us, and it doesn't mean that everybody's story is going to connect with you in every moment of your life. But I feel that the more I have done this work and gone around the world and met people and given voice to things that I've experienced or that the collective have experienced, it gives us all a chance to liberate ourselves from the old story um, because that level of sensitivity, um, either to the pain of others or the pain of ourselves or the pain of the world, it's a real roadblock until you figure out the gift within it and how to access the gift within it. So for me, I was stalked by my guides with messages for people um, until I kind of surrendered and did it as a job. And then I realized I was on my path, even though this was not the path I thought I was going down. I was going into music. Um, this wasn't even a career. Surely no one would come for a reading when my friend suggested you should do readings. I, you know, she was a shaman and a yoga teacher. She said, I've got a mailing list of 300 people. Let me send you out to them. And I did it because I was just daring myself to face all my fears at that point based on some of the workshops I was attending. I didn't realize it was going to take me the way it has taken me. Um, but I feel that that's where we have to listen to the intuition. The intuition will walk us into opportunities, experiences, and essentially help us break our patterns um, if we're willing to go with it. So um, yeah, you just have to get, you have to get good at discomfort, I think, when you live intuitively, which I'm sure you and everyone listening knows. Yeah. You have so many big, big subjects in this book. I love it. Relationships, sex, sexual energy. I mean, it's no joke. And, and, and as I was teasing you, like, just a few notes. I that love I, seeing that. That's so cool. Abundance. Yeah. Opening to love. So I want to try to bring some of these aspects in here because I felt they were profound. But you I, know, yeah. You no, know, sorry. You ha I, I, thought, I thought you'd finish, but carry on, please. So the, the end of that thought is this. Because you address something that I really appreciated here, which is about people who are sensitive and empaths. So I, for sure, clairsentient, empath, 100%. Don't know what else, but for sure I do know those. And as a sensitive, if you will, it's a beautiful way to title that, these subjects I thought were really important to talk about. So um, I have ideas and questions that I wanna ask to facilitate maybe some of the listeners but I also want to acquiesce to what popped for you as well. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, one of the gifts, I was writing a whole other book and it was in my voice and it was a much more intuitive, uh, it was, yeah. And that book may still, still appear. Um, but everything started pointing towards um, put the channeled material out. So 85% of the book is channeled material. Mm -hmm. And because we had 15 years, well, 12, we started the book three years ago. So about 12 years to pull from, I was able to literally go, okay, we're going to do the greatest hits. We're going to do the most popular topics. We're going to do the, the best, the, the kind of recordings that have been the most consumed because I wanted it to be of the most use to people. And I also didn't know if I would ever do another channel book again. So I was like, okay, let's just really put it all in there. Um, but to kind of pick up on what you said next, um, this, the words sensitive and empath are tricky because people tend to, I've kind of seen everything with those words. Empaths sometimes believe they are better than other people because they're empaths. And my argument is always that we're all everything. 
So just in the same way that we're all somewhere on the autism spectrum, mm-hmm. so that's, too that's is every very interesting yeah. that you say that. Yeah, all of us. All of us are on every energy spectrum somewhere. We might be at 0.1% of it, but I believe that we're all intersecting with everything on the planet at the time. I really do. And so empaths and sensitives are people who have a very high degree of empathy and sensitivity versus the average person existing at the same time on the planet. But the problem can be, I think, that many empaths and sensitives have lived with their wounds for so long. For some of them, it can become an identity. Mm -hmm. And feeling like a victim in the world can become an identity. And I certainly had my times where I felt like a victim of my sensitivity. So one of my great passions is, okay, human life isn't easy for anybody. And I'm not saying it doesn't have its wondrous high moments, it's peaceful, because it has all of that, but it's also challenging as well. And that's the truth for everybody who's walked this earth. So what are the sensitives and the empaths here to teach? And I believe that the healed empath and the healed sensitive who isn't being dominated by their wounds on a daily basis. Sure, they'll come up for healing periodically. That's part of being a human. They have gifts to share with the world that are going to help the rest of the world get in touch with their empathy and their sensitivity. So my passion is really working with that group to help them find their powers. So one of mine has been creativity and one of mine has been using my healing work to help others heal themselves. And I look at you, Debbie, and it's like, perfect. You are here giving voice, holding space, bringing positive energy to people. So I think that's where the sensitive and the empath side of of my work and this book, um, why it had to play such a big part, because I feel like empaths and sensitives at this time in history are poised to go to the next level in their lives, to kind of shake off the shackles of being marginalized or feeling marginalized. And boy, oh boy, when that group have their stuff together and are able to put stuff into the world, it awakens the empathy and the sensitivity in every single soul on the planet to the, to the degree that it, they, they need. So I will just caveat by saying, we also need doctors. We need people who are driven. Everybody is needed. Everybody is their specific jigsaw piece. But that was a part of my mission and a part of my jigsaw piece to kind of help be an activator for the sensitives and the empaths, an activator and a support. Yes, 100%. Thank you for that. And I think the pieces that are, the many pieces in this book are very helpful for them to be poised because without the self-love, how could they? Without the abundance, how could they? Without the right relationships and partnerships, how could they? And so much more. So it, it really is a, a very nice map, if you will, to help people fill in those places and spaces inside so we can be the light workers we came here to be. And I want to say too, I, the, the reason why I laughed about the book, with the media stuff I do, the visibility stuff, I teach book writing, right? I teach and coach how to write a book. And I tell people this all the time, like we're literally as authors giving birth to an entity, if you will, which is the book, and it has a voice. And I've done that too. I've written an entire over 200 page book when the book said, I'm not it. It's something else. I'm like, really? <laughs> Great. <laughs> We're starting all over again, but I, you know, you have to honor the voice and the timing and the energy and all that. It is what it is. I love hearing you say that. That's fantastic. And, and you know, I always, uh, whenever I've talked or taught on creativity, I always say there is a divine timing. You know, it's not necessarily that you're blocked. Yeah, sure. Maybe you are. But if you're producing something for the rest of the world, the rest of the world has to be ready to receive it and everything has to line up. And the biggest thing I always kind of l- like to remind creatives is the ricochet effect that happens at you when you put something out into the world. It's like you're making it, you're making it, you're making it. You put it out and then there is going to be a ricochet effect to you. So it's such a metaphysical experience. So I love that that's a big part of what you do. And um, it's great that you're, you're, you're sharing that message. I could have used a phone call with you about two weeks before the book came out when I was like, why do I feel strange? Oh, right. <laughs> Oh yes, what a it's it is it's the most amazing process for very brave people without yeah. a doubt. Well, we're going to be taking a very quick break and when we come back, 
we have so many amazing questions for Lee Harris, including about relationships with others and being or not being prosperous. This is Dare to Dream, where I feature successful, fascinating transformational leaders who have created major goals. So what about you? What would you do if you knew you could not fail? And what would it take for you to feel completely free and bold for you to create your dreams? This is Dare to Dream podcast. We are the number one transformation conversation. And if you're enjoying this show, for $1 or more if you choose, you can go to patreon.com slash dare to dream and donate and make a difference. You have a really big job, if you will, for your soul to fulfill. And patreon.com slash dare to dream is about supporting the show. Dare to Dream is always going to be free to you. And to help the show flourish and become sustainable on the business and the operational end, go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. We are past 12 years on air and we love having you as part of the team. If you're tuning in after we've started, this is Debbie Dashinger on Dare to Dream, and I'm interviewing Lee Harris, globally acclaimed intuitive messenger. You can visit him at leeharrisenergy.com. So Lee, I wanted to start with the aspect of relationship. You talk about in the book that regarding being in relationship with another, that there is a big secret. I love the word secret. There's a big secret to success and that's about keeping committed to being present and to being self-loving. So why are presence and self-love important com components? And what do they bring when we're in relationship? Well, I think, you know, if you think about people that you're around who are very present and who have a high degree of self-love, they feel good to be around. You know, they, they and, and a high degree of self-love is also knowing your boundaries. So it's, it would be me saying to you, hey, Debbie, I would really love you to come out on Friday night and, and just hang out with me. And you might go, yeah, no, I can't Friday because I've just had a really big week. So I'm going to go home and rest, but I would love to do that another time. That's going to make me, unless I have a rejection wound, which is a great chance to process it, I'm going to go, oh, cool. Well, I, I can trust Debbie. She's always going to kind of know who she is and where she is. And she was just saying no for now. And so those kinds of vibrations from us to other people, they really sponsor the growth of that in others. So for example, if I am mirrored by that, sorry, if that is mirrored to me by somebody, then I have the chance to grow into that. And I also have the chance to go through all my wounds and all my healing. If I'm like, well, Debbie didn't want to go out with me. What's wrong with me? Then you and I are not really going to be a good match. And it's probably not a good idea if we're in an intimate relationship or a close relationship to try and stay together because it's just going to hurt both of us. You're going to be like, well, I know I need to have Friday to myself. I could compromise to try and make Lee's wound happy. And so this is where we have to really be sovereign in, in intimate relationships. I think so many of us were kind of brainwashed into the one day your prince or princess will come and it will all be fabulous. And of course it isn't really like that. And it's not a fairy tale. And too often because of those beliefs, we have a sense of ownership over other people. It's like, Oh, well, they're my partner. So they should, that's your own mind talking. Um, you know, that's actually something you might want to talk to them about and say, hey, I have this belief that because we're partners, you should want to go out with me on Friday night and not stay home and repair yourself, at which point you can go, okay, well, I have an experience of if I go out on Friday night, I'm going to be dead on Saturday and Sunday because I can tell I'm tired. So can we reschedule? And if you and I can find a common ground in that. So that takes a certain level of presence and self-love to be able to communicate through that hard stuff. And I think the old paradigm of relationships is changing on the planet. One of the things that I, I didn't really understand many years ago, but I now understand what the Z's were driving at. They say in every relationship, your job is to be yourself as much as you can be yourself, which is very contra to the Hallmark card, which is be loving, be kind, be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good parent. But whose standards, uh, whose standards are saying what good is? So, the more you allow yourself to come out, 
the more you will be a benevolent presence on the earth and you will be better for your partner if your decision makes them slightly uncomfortable in the moment, but you know for you it's the truth. And that is hard and it's hard for all of us to practice at first, but the more you do it and the more you make it your norm, and it isn't selfish or narcissism as some people would believe, and hey, if, if, if you are experiencing it as selfish and narcissism, you shouldn't be with that person either because that means there isn't enough connectivity or give and take between the two of you. So they say that if you practice these principles and they talk about it in a bit more detail in the book, that that will get you to be in your, what's the word, your true vibration in every relationship. True vibration. And I love those words, benevolent and sovereign. That carries a lot of royal power, it feels like, in it. For oneself. And there's a really profound passage in the self love journey chapter in your book that talks about how really important it is for us to parent and care for ourselves. You point out that I love this line just like our actual parents, we probably don't parent ourselves perfectly, and that's okay. We can make incremental improvements right now. So I appreciate the idea of seeing and hearing and holding and celebrating and loving ourselves the way we want those aspects to be, and that it's time for us to turn our attention inward, to give to ourselves that which we want. In other words, those things, like I had a rough childhood too, you know, I grew up around a lot of narcissists and a lot of loneliness, and I also turned to sugar quite a bit. Um, both is a way to leave my body. A food for me was a way to leave my body because I didn't like being in my home, mm -hmm. but also sugar, I don't even know what that was, but it was, it was definitely an addiction. And so, you know, the idea that they did this, you know, at a certain point, it's like, yeah, that, that needs to, that story needs to change. It's not serving us. It's not healing anybody. It's actually stuckness. So for those who are living in that still, but love this idea, this yumminess you're talking about, about really parenting ourselves and finally giving ourselves what we've been longing for. Are there ideas or suggestions that you can offer that we can start to insert that kind of presence and that kind of self-love into our lives? If you ask any parent on the planet, is parenting easy? None of them are gonna say yes. Some of them might say, oh, it's not easy, but it's the most beautiful thing. It's the most challenging. And then some of them are going to go, oh my God, it's not, it's really hard. And I sometimes think I'm doing a really bad job. So I always remind people of that and myself with self-parenting. It's not easy. It doesn't, it doesn't protect you. Having an attitude of self-parenting, it, it doesn't protect you or take away some of the negative thoughts, negative feelings, challenging moments but it's an insurance policy for when they do show up. If you have agreed, I am going to self-parent and be kind to myself, then whatever comes your way, you're including that in the conversation. And it sounds, you know, and I'm sure many people listening had similar experiences to you and I, Debbie. My old mode was to follow the negative thought down the downward spiral. My new mode is to recognize that too many stressors, too many challenges, too many negative thoughts are a sign for me that I need to breathe, I need to replenish, I need to give myself a short break, I need to take on any of the tools that I have to help my body come back to center as much and as fast as it can so that I can be present for life. So really self-parenting is really about a commitment to I'm going to come back to presence as much as I can and you are absolutely not failing if you aren't living that way 24 seven. In fact, when you start self-parenting and presencing yourself, it's quite normal for things to get quite in a big way at first because your body goes, oh great, she's finally self-parenting me. Well, then I'm gonna show her this tantrum that I've saved since <laughs> the age of 13. Now I'm gonna show her this sadness that I couldn't access at the age of 18. So the body wants to heal and we want to heal. And when the right teachers, support or circumstances show up in our life, the healing begins. So when we start to go, I don't know if I'm any good at this self-parenting thing, but I think I understand the principle. When I catch myself kicking myself, 
replace the negative words with a positive thought. Okay, so I just told myself, oh, Lee, you stupid idiot, you got it wrong again. And I caught it. That's great. That's awareness. Okay, well, that's okay. Now I'm going to say, Lee, you are doing the best you can. I love you. It's all okay. I'm going to say that out loud so that I negate the script that I have been running as a pattern for my life and I start to turn it in the other direction. So like actual parents in life, um, self-parenting is gonna be a mystery and a challenge at times. And it's very much, you're, you're learning it in the moment, but it's just you agreeing to be kind to yourself when you feel the world isn't being kind to you, your story isn't being kind to you, or the world itself is an unkind place. Because those are states that all of us have been in, can go into, and in those moments when we have a child that's freaking out in the room, or that's in tantrum or in terror, we soothe that child. We do things to bring that child out, to try and help them regulate, to try and help them come back to reset. So self-parenting is just recognizing the child in you is doing the best they can. And that at moments, you know, adulting is gonna seem uh, a lot more scary without some self-parenting. Hmm. I want to talk also about being or not being prosperous, being or not being abundant, having or not having money, all of that. Because <clears throat> you mentioned that it brings us back to parts of ourselves that are destined to be united with these aspects, money, prosperity, abundance. That's very powerful. And you suggest that money is our mirror. So how do we use our current financial reflection to change, to positively change our financial domain? Mm. They've, they've talked a lot about abundance and finance and money over the years. Um, and, and it's always interesting to me because especially when you look at how um, <clears throat> unjust our money system is on our planet, we already are working in a system where there are people in countries who have nothing and we do not work cohesively as a world government to try and change that. Um, and then you have people who seemingly have everything material, but still not happy, still miserable, still depressed, still anxious. So for me, abundance on the one hand, money is part of it, but it's really uh, the feeling of freedom in being alive. Um, the feeling of, having your needs met, having the resources that are going to help you meet your needs and feeling that you can be a creative, um, creative force in the world rather than someone just trying to survive, which I know many people do. There is a starving artist, starving healer syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I came from the starving artist background, um, being in music and doing theater as a kid. So I knew that one well, but I didn't realize that it also existed within the healing communities. And I think, you know, those are the worlds I've worked in around abundance, but I just think it's, it's a worldwide thing. Um, it is something that I'm beginning to see change on the planet because there's more of an understanding of your thoughts create reality or can contribute to creating reality. So it's important to identify what did I grow up around when it comes to money? what were the beliefs that I inherited that aren't necessarily my truths, but that I have taken on and that are now capping my ability to earn? And what are the things that I say out loud and affirm to other people? Because these things are very, very um, powerful. So for example, if you're, oh no, I can't go on holiday this year, I'm broke. You've just said out loud and that person's gonna walk away and go, oh, Debbie's broke, oh, okay. Oh, I won't ask Debbie to do anything that is involved with money again, because Debbie just told me she's broke. So we have to be very careful about what we say. But, but even more than that, we have to really know what our values are. Because there are all these stories out there of, yeah, you too could be a billion dollar entrepreneur and have a private jet. And, you know, and I've met many of those people and some of them are really enjoying their life and some of them are miserable. So for you, it might not be about having a million or a billion dollars. It might be about having freedom. And yet because of societal pressure or societal belief, you're kind of confused about where you should put your energy. So often abundance comes from simplifying and from really paying attention to areas that you might be losing resources, financial or energetic. And those two things go very hand in hand. 
if you're really bad with your emotional boundaries, if you're somebody who gets used by others a lot or taken advantage of or because you can't say no, you find that you're constantly exhausted because you're serving everybody, the mirror in your financial life will be quite acute because you're constantly giving everything out and you're never filling yourself. So you also won't necessarily be being taken care of financially. So I often see that playing out for people, people who have kind of adopted kindness and generosity as a really a cover for feeling they don't deserve to keep or retain anything or receive anything. And that's why there's a chapter in the book called the art of receiving, where they really talk about our inability to receive by nature. We are generous, benevolent people. And that's, what we would be if our true spiritual divine nature was allowed to come out, if our soul was allowed to show up in our life more, we will naturally become benevolent and generous. But our soul will also mean that we're looking after ourselves and that we are able to feed people because we can see how much food we've got in the cupboard and we don't give our last bit of food away and just trust that some food is going to come into the house in a week and then be in terror for five days because you're starving. So Really abundance is what I have noticed and, and work I've done with people. I have a course called Abundance Upshift. If you really want to shift your abundance, you have to be willing to really examine who you are, what your values are, what you learned as a kid that might still be running that isn't helpful. Be grateful for what you got taught as a kid that's really helpful and just do a kind of examination process and really know what you want because too many of us don't have accurate dreams around abundance because we're trying to outrun scarcity. So for example, people go, oh, if I just had a million dollars, everything would be fine. Actually, if you had an extra $15,000 a year or $20,000 a year, you'd be okay because that would be enough to get you where you want. So that's what I mean by really understanding what your values are, what you want, but we tend to be scared to look at it because money brings up such emotion for us that we tend to just back away and think that we don't understand it and we don't know anything about it, or we don't want to look at our bills. And all of those things contribute to not really allowing abundance to run through our body because we're keeping it at arm's length. That was a long and varied answer. That but was good though. Thank you. No, I'm so glad you fleshed that out because you just gave me actually a huge piece there at the end. What I really like about what you said, and it feels different to me, is that it's, you're giving us an invitation to act as a forensic investigator. Mm. So there's a lot of detachment in that, which I think is important around money, right? We all know money is an illusion, it's an energy, it's silly, it's just a piece of paper, and yet we attach so much significance to it. And the way you just explained it, it's a way of looking at our past lives, what we're carrying forward, and really looking at what is right now and inviting in a new possibility, but there's a forensic aspect to it that occurs in order to get some ahas. I, I'm gonna actually start doing some things because of what you said. I feel, um, I feel so blessed sometimes around some of the things you're talking about because Lord Jesus and the apostles, I have come so far around you know, scarcity. Like I was an actress and a singer for the majority of my life, which means work, 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 make money. <clears throat> Nothing. Yes. And, Creatively, also, it, for my soul, it was incredibly painful to have that no thing because all I wanted to do was create. And then again, finally getting hired again and create, create, create money, money, money. And that brah, it was exhausting for me, yeah. difficult. But it also created where I came from, created financial stuff, living like that, created financial stuff. And when I shifted to be an entrepreneur, mamma mia, you know, no one gives you a business degree and you're sort of floundering to figure out how do I bring a client so it took a lot of healing I feel like actually way more than learning business stuff I just had to do a lot of healing so my resonance changed around all of this and there's so much ease today and I still find this so fascinating to go deeper with it yeah, no, I love everything you just said, because I know the entrepreneur's path myself, and I didn't understand business, but as things around me grew, I had to learn, otherwise um, there were going to be car crashes, um, and I had a few small car crashes that told me, oh, I'd better know how this car moves, especially now there are more people in it with me. Um, 
Yeah, and, and I, I love what you just said about the, um, you know, being an artist. Because I also have that, I have an artist spirit, but I have a creator spirit. So I think when you have that spirit, it, it, it fits entrepreneur, entrepreneurism very well. But one of the big learnings is, you know, as artists and creatives, we love freedom because you have to be free and you have to be in a free state to let the good stuff come through. Yet to be a good entrepreneur, you have to have structure. Mm. And I definitely learned the hard way um, and with a bit of kicking and screaming, um, structure can give me freedom if I understand it will. And I organize my structure as well. So for example, you know, now 15 years on, I have a team of 10 people that I employ and work with every month to put all this work out into the world. And we have a rhythm and we, we have marks to hit. And yet I've found I'm more free right now than I've probably ever been and more abundant. But if you had shown me this picture five years ago, I'd have gone, oh my God, that looks like too much work. And what do you mean I, I can't take a month off if I don't want to do an energy update? Or how do I know I want to do an MP3 that month? But what I learned was you, 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 you figure it out as you go along and you create the freedom pockets within the structure and the structure will then give you a freedom. But so I often think there's a, a lot of, um, you, you mentioned healing, there's a lot of reverse learning that goes on for us, which makes sense because we're all here to grow and change and shift as we go through life. So um, I, I think the entrepreneurial journey, which I know many people are embarking on now, it's a really rising thing on the planet, which is great. That is a path of self-growth like no other. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we come back, we'll be talking about where you can find Lee. I want to make sure you know that where this YouTube channel is so you can listen to these amazing updates. And we're going to get just a little more clarity around what I think is a very, very powerful concept, boundaries. I think it's a beautiful thing. So exclusively for you guys, for Dare to Dream listeners, for the viewers, I've made a unique deal with Thinkific that is only available to you if you're ready to create, market, and sell your own online courses. Thinkific's powerful all-in-one platform makes it really easy to share your knowledge, really easy to grow your audience and scale your business if you choose to do that. It doesn't matter if you have 10 students or 10 million, it allows you to grow a business you love. We're speaking about entrepreneurship. I can't think of a better way. It gives you the easiest technology and best support in the business. The link for you to get three months free business platform to put your products is thnk.cc slash deb. It's an exclusive deal to set up your online courses, thnk.cc slash deb. Deb. And again, I'm interviewing Lee Harris. You can find him at leeharrisenergy.com. And um, yeah, I really want to talk about this like, boundaries. Holy moly. And I love the juxtaposition of the words you use because you say boundaries are actually an entry point to profound freedom. Funny because it is very much aligned with what you just talked about being a creative and an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Looking at the structure you created and five years ago, you would have gone, hoo -hoo. but mm -hmm. today you go, oh, yes, yeah, the recipe actually for freedom and prosperity. It works. Mm -hmm. So, talk about boundaries. Why are they so important? How could, like, give us some kind of hot, yummy tip that mm -hmm. we can take out there and really start to create change? Mm -hmm. So um, it was, oh God, it was over a decade ago and I was doing this channel for a group. I think I was in Germany at the time. And there's a line and it's in the book, but I don't remember it exactly right now, but it's something like um, your, the development of your boundaries will open you to life and people like never before. And I remember thinking, Hang on a second. You know, and I, I mean, you know, I, on the one hand, I trusted it enough to get it, but I remember thinking, surely that's a contradiction in terms, especially um, as, you know, certain people in the spiritual field. And I remember when that quote first started going out, um, certain people on the spiritual field will kind of get on their high horse about that statement and go, well, that's not true. I'm just open to everybody. And, you know, and that's fair enough. Maybe that's how they're living and I you know I'm always amused when people feel they have to argue with something I'm like it's okay it doesn't have to be for you it doesn't 
sure, you, you have a different experience, but, but this quote means something for the people it's, it's meant for. And for me, as somebody who kind of had a, you know, definitely a powerlessness over certain people and places um, or, you know, opportunities. I, I, I learned many, many years ago that I needed to learn to say no more often because if I didn't say no, I wouldn't be able to say yes when the right opportunity came along. So for example, you know, someone, we'll go back to the example of going out on a Friday night, you know, I go, oh, Debbie, please come out with me on Friday, Debbie. Debbie, you owe me because I came out with you last month and I was really tired. And Debbie, you're going to be fine. Look, I'll give you a, I'll give you like some vitamins and you'll be fine on Saturday. And if you cave because of me, you go, oh, okay, I'll come. You know, the sign is in your body's reaction. If you ever say yes to something and immediately start to go down before the event has even happened. So if you on Thursday are like, oh God, why did I say I'd go out with Lee on Friday? I'm feeling really having lots of not good thoughts about this. I'm not feeling, that's the sign that you cancel. So a boundary at that point would be, I'm going to say no. And I go, Debbie, you said yes. You can go, yeah, I did. And now I've realized I shouldn't have said yes. So I'm saying no, that's a good boundary. But Debbie, I'm sorry, Lee, I know what you want. And I understand what you want, but I cannot give it to you. I wish I could, but I cannot. And there's your boundary. And then you are free on Friday night to fill yourself back up because on Saturday, you're going to meet somebody really important for your life and you need your energy. The instinct always knows what we can't see up ahead. So boundaries are a very intuitively felt thing. And people are often like, oh my God, I can't say no. And I always say, just do the first few no's and you will find it will get easier and you will not be having to lay down boundaries with people all your life. You do the first person or two and it starts to become not only a muscle, but your energy field starts to emit an energy that people don't try and mess with. So for example, I always say, you know those people at parties, you know, and they walk in and they, they walk in like this and you're like, whoa, I wouldn't mess with them. You can just feel it, you know, do not mess around with that lady who just walked in because she is taking no prisoners if you do something she doesn't like. And it's not that your energy necessarily becomes that aggressive or combative, but there's a surety about you that when you say no to somebody, they go, oh, Oh, okay, Debbie just said no. Or there's the boundaryless version of us. We're like, oh, Lee, you know, I, I would love to, but you know, I, I kind of think I should go home and rest. Oh, come on, Debbie. You know, there's maneuverability. So you have to learn to say no the first few times and then it just gets easier and it becomes set in your energy field. So I always say, take your time. If you have someone in your life you know you need to say no to and you're terrified, get help with it write an email to them that you don't send just to practice. Have a few lines and sentences in your head so that when you go into that conversation, you've got some kind of structure that you're gonna hang on to even though you're nervous. And don't beat yourself up if you don't get it right the first time because you won't. The first time you go, oh God, I, was, I did manage to say no, but it didn't, ah. You know, it's like, don't worry, practice. And, and you'll just get better. And the first time we have to say no, when we're scared of someone's reaction, it can be a big thing. But the more we do it, the more we get used to it, that discomfort turns into an incredible comfort because you know that you are thinking of the bigger picture. You are prioritizing what you feel about the bigger picture and what you know about your needs and the bigger picture. And you are trusting that more than you are trusting someone else's wounded, desperate, or demanding need of you. And that's really important. And what I always say is, because this is one question that comes up a lot, well, Lee, how do I know I'm not letting someone down who really needs me? And I say, you will know when it's an emergency. Mm. And you, no part of you will hesitate to give your time, your energy. I remember my sister taught me this lesson very young. My two nephews who are now, two, my two oldest nephews are now 20, they're twins. Um, she, I'd be with her when they were little and I'd hear the kids scream and I'd be like, oh, are they okay? And she'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And we'd carry on talking. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, there would be a different kind of scream and she would be out of the chair because she knew. She knew when what was real and she knew what was pattern or what was to get attention. And so she never hesitated when she heard that it was desperate. And I always say, 
don't worry if someone is desperate and you are the person to give it to them you will feel it and you will move everything to give it to them but that's very different to freeing yourself from serving other people's needs without including your own at the same time and that's something that many of us people pleasers or recovering people pleasers have done to our detriment and you have to learn the lesson otherwise nobody gets where they need to go least of all that person because if you're not the right medicine for them say no so they can find the right medicine for them someone who's meant to be with them on their level in that moment otherwise both of you are going to feel a little like you've just had a mcdonald's you know it tasted good for like five minutes but sorry mcdonald's you know there's not many nutrition not much nutritional value in that you can cut that if i'm not allowed to say uh say say oh, Grant. that's so good that's like saying you know what this is what i heard with what you shared rather than draining yourself when you know you need your time or attention or space to give, give, give when, you know, your empty vessel at this point. And what I heard in this example is that essentially it's like saying, you know, everyone has a God and I'm not it. Yes. I don't have to show up to be that. They will be okay. The person yes. who's meant to be there or not meant to be there, but it will be perfect for everybody. Yeah, when we're desperate, we don't stop when the first door closes in our face. We then go to the next door. And that's also what I meant by you can feel it when you're someone's last chance mm -hmm. or when you're the right person for them because you will just feel it. There will be no negotiating in your mind. But it's also important to not make yourself so important to this person's future that you must help them even though everything in your body is saying, I'm not your person. That's when we get very distorted. And yeah, the, the, there is a, sure, we're puzzle pieces, but we're only puzzle pieces. It's an amazing jigsaw and it's fun to connect with all the other puzzle pieces and feel the infinite universe, but we're only a puzzle piece. We're not everybody's Lord and savior. Mm. And boundaries are sexy. I gotta yeah. say, I really think so. I think it creates mad respect for somebody like, okay. Really. Well, if you think about it as kids, kids love the teacher who is caring and loving, but has boundaries, you know, also that they feel like, oh, good, someone's in charge. So I don't need to be. 100%. Well, Lee, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams or goals? Or what do the Z's have to say about any kind of dream to be created? Well, that's really interesting because I've just had a period, I've been working, you know, in, in the healing arts for 15 years um, and music was really m where I started and we have brought music in over the recent years, but just in this last couple of weeks, I have felt the call around music in a really big way um, and kind of realized that over the next year or two, I need to give that more of my time and energy and attention. So. That's a path I'm embarking on right now and had a meeting for a music website this morning, which is fun. Um, and, and I think that intersects with what the Z's are saying. You know, one of the things that has come up and I'm perhaps a few months behind everyone else with this, um, that dreams, dreams that you had have been resurfacing and maybe they're in a different form now or they're possible in ways that they, they weren't. But the Z's talked about this about six months ago when they gave a kind of annual forecast for 2019, which is free on YouTube. It's about an hour long. Um, and where is that? What is that channel? So YouTube uh, channel is Lee Harris Energy. And my website is leeharrisenergy.com. So if you go there, you'll see all the links to everything. And yeah, on my YouTube channel, it's called 2019. I forget what it's called, year of something. <laughs> um, but it's there. So if you type in Lee Harris 2019 year of, but my YouTube channel has everything um, there. One of the things they were talking about was dreams resurfacing. Um, but what they talk about within this period that we're in of many years. So they, ref they often talk about between now and 2030. They say that many of the challenges that we're seeing because of the consciousness and the heart frequency and the light that's pouring into the, onto the planet, um, a whole load of ugly is being kicked up. And they say, what you see playing out in the world stage is not going to go away in a hurry. They say, so stop wishing for it to be gone next year. 
start being the solution and start giving your voice, feelings and energy and attention to ways that you would like to see the world change, progress and what you would like to see it become. And it's interesting because I'm a, you know, I have, I have some friends who are social activists and some who um, are, uh, you know, only believe in meditating. And I think everybody is playing their part, whatever you're doing. But I really trust that thread that they keep bringing out. They say, you're going to see innovation happening on the planet and solutions happening on the planet a lot over the next decade. But your news will focus you on all the problems, all the negative because it is still playing out an illusion of control and trying to maintain uh, a control over people. And we're going to see that break more and more as we just keep going through these coming years. So they say, look after yourself, recognize it's intense. It, it, you know, you're not wrong if you're tired or, whoa, why do I feel like this today? It's like, welcome to planet earth circa 2019. You know, it's going to feel like that, that is going on, but, but find ways to, not only stabilize your own life force, but do it so that you can create what the world needs next. And just over a year ago, they said, you are needed and now is your time. And that's a message that I repeated for like a whole year to everybody because it was so pertinent. You are needed and now is your time. That might be with a child that you are helping to raise or you're a grandparent of, or that might be a book or a project that you're doing that's going to affect hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands. The numbers don't matter. What matters is you feeling purposeful about where you're putting your energy and your time. Ta -da. That was such a beautiful ending for me to hear. And YouTube folks, LeeHarrisEnergy.com is his website. And YouTube, go to Lee Harris Energy for all his amazing free videos. And again, the name of the video he just talked about, which is so prevalent, I'm going to recommend to so many of my friends who are currently at a crossroads, very successful and being called to their past gifts. It's called 2019 Year Of. So I will be checking that out as well. And Lee, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the light that you hold here. And it's been a real pleasure for me to connect with you and your listeners. I end today's show with a quote from Lee's book, Energy Speaks. And you can go out and get your copy too and make all your fabulous notes. And the quote is this, your biggest job here on earth is to love yourself and to learn to love yourself, especially when you feel unlovable. When you learn to nurture and love yourself as you would another, when you give yourself that attention, things change very fast. Things move in you. The self-love is a pure remembrance that everything is love. You have no idea how lovable you are. It's incredible. You're so very lovable and so very loved. Breathe. You are clear. You are love. Next week on Dare to Dream Radio Podcast YouTube, I'm featuring Gerard Powell, who's the owner of the transformational resort in Costa Rica called Rhythmia. Rhythmia offers groundbreaking medically supervised plant medicine, instruction along the spiritual guidance for their guests to experience a healing and an awakening. And we're going to be talking about Jerry's amazing journey, his life advancement center at Rhythmia, and his book called Shit the Moon Said. So subscribe to this number one transformation conversation and get these in your inbox every week. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream.